All right, some numbers to begin with, just so the man in question can hear them all in one go. 63 tests, 226 wickets, best of 7 for 12, match best of 11 for 76, 8 fifers and a 10 for 58 ODIs, a best of 5 for 33 there. 744 first-class wickets in 211 matches, 27 fifers. Uh, he was the number one bowler in the world for a period. He nailed Ponting in the 05 <laughs> Ashes in his face at one point, which we've all seen on YouTube. Uh, we, as Australians, I would say, on behalf of the country, we respected his wheels. We respected his pace. And there's not too many blokes whose wheels we respect in Australia. That's a little secret I'll let you in on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he he was one. Uh, UK folks will be familiar with him on TalkSport. He's also got a brand new YouTube channel. Uh, we're talking to Steve Harmison. Harmy, welcome to The Great Cricketer, mate. Thank you very much for having me. Can I call you Harmy to begin with? Yeah, you call me what you want. Because a lot of people call me a lot worse, to be fair. But yeah, especially Australians, to be fair. I just, I just say from the top, I'm, I don't, I'm sorry if I'm overstepping the mark here, but your salad, your hair is looking unbelievable Terrific. on YouTube here. Like, I haven't mm. seen it like that before, but uh, it sort of has like a sort of a Mancini style oh, managerial yeah. uh, streak to it. Can, mm. can you walk us through the, the hair? I've gone back to me adolescent youth, to be fair. Oh. Um, I, when I first started playing, um, I, I'll never forget, I played a game at Warwickshire. My f- like f- my second first-class match, first one away from home. And my hair was like this. It was all over the shop. Because oh. um, of you know, what it was like when I was a kid. Um, it's like secret headbanger, rock, rock, yeah, rock oh. star sort of thing. And I can't remember who the batsman was, but I didn't appeal for an LBW. My first ever captain was a little fella from Australia who terrified the terrified the life out of me. You can say he was five. About five foot <laughs> yeah, seven. Yeah, yeah. And that was that David Boone. And he uh, I didn't appeal. And he come marching over, you know, asking me politely in Boone's manner why I didn't appeal. And I said my hair was in my eyes. And I didn't have this hair for much longer after that. He marched me to the barbers and got it told me to get it cut more or less put a piercing over my head and cut round it and just made sure that I didn't I didn't get the uh, the hair and the eyes anymore and I appeal for every LBW after that even if they were going down leg side going over the top or missing by miles he scared the shit out of me when I first started playing and he was uh in uh, that was the hair the from the hair from there never really got that long so in lockdown COVID I went back to the long. It'll come off soon, but I was I was just bored, lazy, and and gone back to my younger days. Normally, when I kick off the interview, Harmy, like I'll ask about grade cricket or club cricket growing up, but I, I want to change that now and just go straight to playing with David Boone yeah. because, like in Australia, David Boone is a cult figure. Like, I mean, he is a real spirit animal for a certain type of Australian of a certain era, and yet, and maybe this is his charm, but we don't hear much from him. You know, he doesn't put himself out there. Maybe it's because he's an ICC official or some shit. But also yeah. he's just – he's sort of seen and not heard. So can you take us inside to what it's like to play with David Boone? Like does the does the experience match the mystique of it? Uh, and did he teach you anything? Um, yeah, he probably taught me things that I didn't really need to be taught. But <laughs> yeah, it was very, very start. <laughs> Um, I knew how to. I knew how to order drinks from the bar, and I usually had to go and get them from the bar. And I knew how to sit and help him drink them. So that was an early, early insight to where my my life was on its way that way anyway. Um, just meeting David at sort of thirty seven, when I think I was only eighteen, nineteen, was um, was something that I, I was brought up in a, a social background. So um, and but. It took me about, and I would say it took me about three months to even speak to him. I couldn't, I just couldn't speak to him. There's this, this fellow sitting in the corner of the room who was giving directions and telling us where to go and what to do and where to bowl. And, you know, he was a brilliant man, absolutely brilliant man. But I just couldn't speak to him. This is the guy that I've watched on TV just get 100 after 100 against England. Um, he had that famous record that, you know, I'm not sure his wife is, I'm sure Pip's sick of people talking about <laughs> um, on an aeroplane. And he was just brilliant, honestly. What a, what a bloke. And, but he always said, I always said, to, I always said, it took me three months to even speak to him. Mm. He said it took six months for him to understand a word I said, because he just, he <laughs> was always, and I, I was a lot more broad Geordie by the, uh, you know, when I was, when I was 18, yeah. 18 19, I've changed a little bit because of obviously where I've been in the world and I was sick of repeating myself. Um, <laughs> but he just, he just he, he, 
it, it was just it was a it was a fantastic part of my upbringing when you, you go on a field with a guy who's played 107 test matches Durham were Durham weren't very good when he came to Durham Durham weren't very good we were we were crap we were we, even even three day games teams were only only booking in for two two nights at the hotel because we weren't lasting that long. <laughs> and then the club changed. The club changed. 1997, when David Boone came to England, I think it's a little bit like Tasmania when Tasmania won the Sheffield Shield for the mm. first time. This character, the aura that he gave off was just amazing. Mm. And the three years that he had, that ended, he finished his playing days and finished his first class career in Durham was arguably the, 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 the starting point for Durham to kick off as a, as a club and as a county. Because um, there's a lot of good young players came through at that time, the likes of Paul Collingwood, um, myself, Neil Colleen. Mm. Um, we had some good young players that are coming from the little village, the, the little like, mining towns around, mm. and, uh, and 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 Booney just sort of nurtured us in the right direction. But he wasn't there for a. What you sometimes find is overseas finished the days off and was there for a peer day. And, yeah, David wasn't there. David didn't seem to be there for that. He cared about what he was there for. Mm. And there was a couple of innings that stick out in my mind. You know, we played against South Africa in 99, I think it was. It would have been his last year. And and I mean, they, got, they went for him. They went for him. We, I, I didn't help it, but I broke Jerry Liedenberg. Yeah, just getting 100 in the first test. I broke his thumb in the first innings. And they had Nancy Harewood, Sean Pollock, Alan Donald, um, Brian McMillan, who Oof. bowled slippery. Yeah, yeah. And so they had four, four quick bowlers. And they came out and they went at us. But they didn't just go at us, they especially went at Booney. I think Donald was bowling around the wicket and he hit him in the side of the grill, bust his grill. And any, or I reckon any other overseas at 37-year-old who'd had his play in 107 test matches would have just chipped one up in the air and walked off. Nah, Booney got 90. He stood there. He took mm. it between 80 and 90. Stood there, took it, kept hitting it. And it was, it was that, that was an eye-opener for me because mm. I didn't realise... You know, the game, the toughness of the game, mm. playing against an international team who were playing at international level because they'd played the first test. So they weren't just here for a, you know, for a warm up. And Booney was just, he was brilliant. And that was, that was the realisation that he cared about what he was doing at Durham and the stealing mm. determination that he tried to give to all the young players. Mm. Um, I can't speak highly enough for the guy. He mm. is... He was amazing. Mm. He was amazing. I, I couldn't drive for the first year of my, my contract. So my wife and my wife, my girlfriend at the time, wife now, all my, my parents had to come pick me up. But they're like picking me up at like five o'clock after work. Mm. We finished training at, th- at sort of half two at three. And he'd, he'd sit and it was, I think it was an excuse to get out of the house. I think he had a madhouse, <laughs> didn't he, Jack? And the girls and, and Pip was there and he would like, you would stay for a couple of couple of beers. And he's like, oh, just wait, man, just wait, we'll harm me on, on your lift. So I got to know that side of the man. But I tell you what, what, what an appointment at Durham did, mm. getting it. And uh, he didn't disappoint, but he was brilliant. What about, uh, what about you growing up, Harmy? Were, were you always just sort of that sort of, big, fast bowler buying heavy balls or, you know, we hear a lot of stories about guys who get into international cricket. They started by, you know, opening the batting or bowling some off spin <laughs> and they like just going to bowl some pace. Were you, were you always, you know, the big, mean, fast bowler? Not really. Um, not really. I had no interest in cricket when I grew up, really, to be honest. No interest whatsoever. I was football. Mm. Um, my batting skills have always been the same. I've always been a number 11. <laughs> so even when I was a junior, I was a number 11. I just barely got a, got used to holding the grip properly when I got to first class cricket. Um, but no, I had no interest in cricket whatsoever. Cricket was a game that was played for me for about eight, ten weeks of the year because I always missed the first six games of the cricket season because I was playing football huh. and I missed the, la- the, f- the, the back end of it because I always started the football season. It wasn't until... I played for Northumberland under 16s, I think it was, against Durham's under 16s. And I think it was uh, Jeff Cook was watching Michael Goff, the umpire, uh, the fantastic umpire, mm. great guy as well, Goffy. Um, I think Jeff was watching, come to watch him as a 16 year old. And he, um, I played in the game. And within two weeks, I'd played, I played two second team games. Then I made my first class debut at the end of that month in September against Leicester. We got battered which is hilarious you know the game was over by like tea time on day two um we were that bad um and that was the sign of the club and that's why i had to bring david boone in yeah. and then that 
that winter, I ended up in on a 19 trip to Pakistan for Christmas and New Year, which I'd, ne- I'd been out, I'd been out the Northeast about three times in my entire life. <laughs> I'd been on an aeroplane once and I was in Pakistan and nothing against Pakistan, hands up. But the culture that I was sort of airlifted into wasn't that something that I was used to. So yeah. that I lasted a fortnight, I ended up going home and I didn't play for another 18 months. So yeah. my cricket into into cricket was... Wasn't it was probably a little bit about my my one day bowling. It was a bit of a roller coaster. Some of them, <laughs> some were good days, some bad days, and not always in the right directions. Mate, I'm so curious about that, you know, because like in in the last couple of months, in particular, like on our with our little operation, we've started speaking to some Indian players, like some current Indian yeah. players, and like uh, for not to characterise them all the same, but like you always hear these stories of like prodigies who had special ways of playing the game from the age of two or three and you see a lot of that footage coming through now and it seems to me that like you have to be so good and so committed from sort of the age of two or three and it has to be your whole life and yet reading your story and also just experiencing a bit of grade cricket and guys who've played at the top when you get to know them for so many guys cricket there might be parts of it that they love. Like, I know you were into bowling so much, but maybe not the rest of the game that much. Mm. Like, you learn that, like, it's not so much that it's a job, but they're very honest about the demands of the game and that maybe they don't love it, you know, that much. It's just some, it's not so much something they just do. They respect that they play for their country and stuff, but it's not like a calling in life or, or this sort of destiny uh, where they've achieved their life ambition. It just happens that they're very, very good at it and they do it. So my question to you is, I, I know you're a little bit like that, but could you tell us maybe how, man, how many other players that you played with at international level, with or against, you feel might have had the same view or, or relationship to cricket? I would say quite a few, to be honest. I would mm. say it, it's like you're asking, you're asking an international cricketer about the sort of inclusive of the rules and you know, the final things of the rules and they'll just look at you with like a deadpan face and go, what do you want about? <laughs> and I've got no idea. I just play the game. I'm just good at the game. Yeah. I don't know the rules. You know, I, I don't know the ins and outs of it. I'm, and I think what I found with, with my career and people around me and that I played with, um, some of the best players in the world are the ones that aren't obsessed by the game. And I mean, there's an obsession. I uh, remember when you played early first class when 2020 first came out and you'd get back from a, a first class game at the end of a day you come back to the hotel obviously being away from away from like from Durham and there'll be people running to the telly to put the, to put the 2020 cricket on and I'm like throwing I'm throwing controls out at Rinder <laughs> just play for seven hours are you not sick of it? Are you not sick of it? I have just you know I put something I'd rather watch Coronation Street or Emmerdale Farm than watch <laughs> yeah, you know, knocked against Warwickshire for a white ball all around the ground. Yeah. I'm just not interested. And a lot of people are like that. To be honest, yeah. a lot of people are like that. And I think that they've got the ability to switch off from the game. So good day, bad day, uh, guys that are up and down and emotional wrecks. Yeah. You know, when they're, when they're really high, when they've got 100 or really low, when they've, they've missed a straight one. <laughs> They're the ones that fall by the wayside. They're the ones that don't make it in the international game. Because five days in a test match is a long time to concentrate from, mm. to stay obsessed in the moment. In the three days before it are just as hard. And I think that's what constitutes a test match week. And that was always the thing when, it was cruel to say this, but I, I could pick people in at Lord's first test match Everywhere, there was, there was always a 14-man squad, England 14-man squad, first test match this summer. There was always at least two or three who were who were new to the group, who were new to the, who had been picked off the back of a good first six games in first-class cricket. Might not going to play, but have been rewarded because of, they've, they've had a good start of the season. And you're sitting at Lords, and after a while, I'm like, you're not going to make it. You're not going to mm. make it. And it was cruel thinking that way, but it was like, by the time a test match starts, Mentally, you were knackered. Mm. They were they were gone. You get your kit on a more on a Monday morning. You, know, you get to Lords. Everything that goes to Lords, the programs are going around. Things that need signing, go out and train, come back in, and you're like a thousand miles an hour. By the time Thursday morning come, they're gone. Honestly, mm. mentally, mm. they were physically physically fine. Adrenaline was going to get them through, but mentally they were gone. And the the, the international game of cricket is the hardest game to play. Mm. Mentally in the world, it's an individual sport played by a team. Yeah. 
Mm. And you're out there facing a the ball or bowling a ball concentration wise. And the three days before that, it, it takes a lot out of you when you're new to it. Mm. And I think the ones that weren't obsessed by the games, the one that could switch off, you know, I finished it, finished the training and, you know, I'll go and lie in a bed and, and just watch something that has got no in, nothing to do with cricket. Mm. I wonder you the- get others that you get others that go in and just tell you on and they're watching mm. they're watching reruns of last game and the reruns of and they're like getting videos of opposition to and it's like I did a thing with Matthew Hoggard yesterday. Um as you can see, me and Hoggy have have found the weight that Andrew Flint Andrew Flint has lost five <laughs> stones since he played cricket. Yeah, yeah. And me and Hoggy, me and Hoggy have definitely found it. He's got, he's got the VAT. I think he's got a little bit extra than what I've got. But we did a cooking thing yesterday, and he had a he had, Hoggy had a simple way. You know, umpires would come in with the balls. Do you want to pick them? No, send them to Hoggard because you knew what was coming. And he went, they're all made by a fucking machine. Yes. <laughs> They're all red, yes. They've all got a steam on. They're all round. You pick one. We bowl with it. Stumps don't move. Twenty-two yards away. The game's simple. If you co- if you complicate it, then it becomes harder. And yeah. that was Hoggy's philosophy. And again, another one that could just switch off. Yeah. Go, you know, go farming. Go and you know, you go and talk to the animals. Hoggy, go. go to, uh, you're at Lords. You go to London Zoo and just have a good conversation. You get more conversation talking to the animals. <laughs> And we, to be fair, Hoggy would get we would we would get more understanding of Hoggy when he's talking to us. But he could switch off and he'd come away. And I, I did a thing on YouTube with Michael Vaughan talking about how to go with the fast bowlers. Mm. And if you if you listen to Michael, you'll see it. If Hoggy was walking back to his mark making animal noises, Hoggy was in a good place and just left him. And that's what that's what we had. You know, we had we had a, a great team spirit, but we had people who weren't obsessed by the game of cricket yeah. who could switch off from it and come back to yeah. it. Um, and that for me is the difference between some of the great players, mm. some of the great players, and some of the players that haven't quite met it. Mm. At, the, at the top level because the obsession to be the best the obsession to you know the cricket is their life just gets in the way because it, it, it physically it, it mentally drains them in key with key yeah. passages of the game which you know sometimes they fall by the wayside because of it and the i mean the guys these days play so much cricket harmony as well yeah. we spoke to trent bolt last year i think it was last year and he took a hat trick against Australia in a World Cup. I think that might have been at Lords, and we asked him about it. And I think he, he'd forgotten about it. He forgot that that was a thing that happened. Mm. You took a yeah. hat trick against India in two thousand and four, the second ever ODI hat trick for England after Jimmy Anderson. But I was watching you take that hat trick, and that I could tell that that meant a lot to you at that, in that moment. It did, yeah, because it, it was the second slower ball in the, in my. It, it was only the second slower ball in my career that actually worked. <laughs> yeah, the second. I think it was. I think it was. Um, I remember, but I can see his face. He just lobbed it back at me, and there was like such a surprise on my face that he didn't pick the slower ball. <laughs> and actually, when he hit it back at me, I, I caught it. So. <laughs> It was, but it did mean something. It, it meant a lot. It, it meant a great deal because, you know, the, the games weren't as thick and fast as mm. what they are now. Mm. The game's so much faster now. I wouldn't say the quality's better. I just think overall it's 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 better for longer. Mm. Um, these guys are are machines now, and it's great to see. And it's great to see the the the. the, the, the that kids have got heroes to aspire, has still got like the, the the heroes to aspire to. But mm. I say that I would not fancy being a bowler in this day and age now because you know the bats are getting bigger, the stumps are getting smaller, it seems, <laughs> and the grounds are getting smaller as well. So yeah. quite happily being a being a world class cricketer from sitting in the commentary box in the commentary <laughs> studio because the minute you know you listen to Nasser Hussain and you listen to Michael Atherton and people like that, boy, they were great cricketers when you listen to them talk on a TV because. <laughs> Three months, two months, I think two months of realising, you know, my career's over and you move into that side. And by the third month after that, whoa, you are the world, you are the world's best, weren't you? So it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's the way the game is, unfortunately. Uh, speaking of NASA, um, you, I, I think you've said in the past you, you could – you said, oh, you, you know, that you could argue that the golden era of 04 to 06 was down to NASA. He, he gave you guys the opportunity that just wasn't offered – in the past, uh, and that he is the reason for the turning point in English in English cricket. So I know you've just um, 
give him a little clip there for fun, but like, <laughs> no, I do all the time. Yeah, tell us, <laughs> tell us about he was NASA. Yeah, as a skipper was, and a bloke. He was NASA. NASA was brilliant um, in his own way. It was it was tough love to be fair with NASA. If you, if you're brutally honest, um, I can see why like to Goffey and Caddick and a few others fell out with him. Um, and there was like people throwing their boots at him. My, my first Ashes trip in 2002, we took, I think we took five, four players that were injured before we even left England. And I think we picked a couple up as we got to Perth. <laughs> um, and it was hilarious. We played, a, uh, I think it was the, it might have been Western Australia's second team. We got beat. We got, we got beat. NASA's, there's a set of crutches in the room. NASA's, NASA's having a go at Fred for not Andrew Flintoff for not being fit, who had just had a double hernia operation about two months earlier. Yeah, Goffey with a bad knee, who all the will in the world, we were Goffey was never going to be fit for that for that trip. But we took him on a we took him on a plane journey just for the sake of it. And there were his two two sort of key men. And uh, Goffey was his best bowler. Um and and Freddie was going to balance balance a side out that we you know we're gonna, we were playing against the best side in the world. Um, and I think that got to Nasta's frustration. And there was one game at one night, one afternoon at the end of when he got out and he had a, and I'm sitting in the dressing room and I've got Goffey slanging, at, hurling him insults at Nasser. Nasser throwing things at Goffey, telling him to get fit. I think his boots went one way. Nasser's cricket kit went the other way. And I'm going, we're getting beat off Western Australia's second team. We have got Hayden Langer, Ponton, Gilchrist, Martin, Steve Wall, Brett Lee, Glenn McGrath, Shane Warne, Gillespie. We've got these to come in a three weeks t- two weeks' time and we're getting beat off of, <laughs> off a bunch of club cricketers. And my hero, Darren Goff, and my captain are now fighting with each other. I'm not sure this trip's going to go very well. So, <laughs> But NASA was, NASA was great. I, I'm, honestly, I, I, I do take the mickey out of him quite a bit, but he was, he, at the time in my career, that I, what I needed. NASA was, the, was what we needed. Ian, to Ian, both of them having a go at him, telling him if I was Steve Harmison, I'd throw the ball at him. No beefy, it wasn't. It was NASA was right what he was doing. He was making sure that we understood, learning the game as we going along and, and understood what, what the team was needing at the time. He's under immense pressure. And the Michael Vaughan era, Michael Vaughan era was only, it was built on the, the foundation that Nasser was saying, Gives you that tough love, and it was the right time for NASA to move over. You know, we would, we we started to understand each other's game. We knew that the team was going to move move on. We needed a little bit more of a relaxed captain outlook of what was going on because we didn't need the the instructions that you know, firm instructions that that NASA was was given. And if it is a fault, which I don't believe it is a fault. There's a guy that loved playing for England and wanted England to win so much. I talked earlier about the obsession. Mm. That was that was a bit like that was what Nasser Hussein was. He is a brilliant broadcaster now. Mm. I think he's probably one of the best on the TV. Mm. And I'll not have many bad words said about Nasser unless they're coming out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> now we're just on to the uh, one of the more forgotten series in Test cricket history, the 2005 Ashes, Harmy, um, that, no, yeah. that no one ever talks about. Um, <laughs> one of the um, one of the sort of the, the, the the key man, the catalyst in that series was Gary Pratt, um, who obviously ran out Ricky Ponting. And uh, I'd imagine did, that yeah. I'd imagine that uh, he played his club cricket at Newcastle Cricket Club. He he was playing at Durham yeah. at the time. I think you were playing at Durham at the yeah. same time. So I think you would have known him relatively well beforehand. But but what was yeah. Gary Pratt like on the circuit afterwards when he was on the rooftop buses going around uh, Trafalgar Square? It was amazing. I couldn't stop looking at. I was like, "What are you doing on this bus?" Um, <laughs> I, he ran Ricky Ponting out. Yeah, fine. <laughs> I got uh, look. I I watched Gary Pratt grow up. I played with his older brother Andrew. Um, I didn't play with his, his other older his, his brother older again Neil. He was just a bit before my time with with Durham. They were a family obsessed by the game of cricket. Um, two, and to be harsh and to be cruel, two thousand and five ended his cricket career. It did. It ended his cricket career. I thought he was a, he was a fantastic batsman. And I mean, as a young player, he was a, he was a fantastic player. Yeah. He was he wouldn't have been far away in the development, carrying on, of being on the verge of you know challenging for a place in that side outright. There was one game we played at Ilford. Ilford, I never forget. Like, Shuey Law was captain of Essex. We chased two hundred and twenty for two down, and Pratt and a, a kid called Nicky Peng, 
who had a who got a he was another one who was you know destined for big things. But Neil, the Zimbabwe bowler and Neil Johnson hit him on mm. the back of the head. Not too dissimilar, not too far away from the tragic thing that happened with Phil Hughes and and Pengy never got never got his his feet back going forward again and his career sort of slowed down a bit. But him and Peng, Pratt and Peng got hundreds in the game. And it was it was two young lads under the age of 20. And I was like, wow, this is we've got two two sort of unbelievable young players here. This is something special. Um and 2005 he just he stopped playing cricket. He was he was the fielder, and that was it. He he didn't go back to Durham and play a great deal of second team cricket to get him back in the first team. It seemed to go to his head a little bit that he was this he was this superstar fielder, um, and I don't think his cricketing career ever really recovered. He got a little bit of fame and fortune, not much, when it comes to his fifteen minutes of fame, and then he disappeared. And it's a shame because I thought that lad had a lot of talent as a cricketer himself mm. um but what a fielder he was a fantastic fielder mm. we knew we knew when we brought him in that he was a, a fantastic fielder but for two years before that every chance we got to bring a 12th man in if he was available it was always Paul Collingwood Paul mm. Collingwood was was the Gary Pratt before he made his test match debut and and Collie would come and do the and do the fielding and that was the manipulation of the system that mm. England well, we, we always used to make sure that if a 12th man goes off, you've got one of the best fielders in the country coming on. We had another little kid from Durham as well, Gary Park, um, playing the point on a play for Derbyshire, I think he did. Another fantastic fielder. So it, it, the, the one thing that disappoints me about the whole, and, then, and it, it is a, off, off a bit of hindsight, but Gary Pratt came on the field for Simon Jones. Mm. Simon Jones never played cricket again after that. Yeah. After after going off the field there. Yeah. Um, so the only twelfth man we had in the building at the time was Gary Pratt because everybody else had gone off. I think Chris Tremlett had gone off to play for for Hampshire. So you know, it, it, if it wasn't Gary Pratt, it would have been somebody else. Would they have ran Ponton out? Possibly not. But he uh, he definitely had his fifteen minutes of fame. Mm. Ah, good fielding. Um, <laughs> yeah, hey, Army, um, I'm not sure Ricky saw the funny side of it. Yeah, that's kind of what makes it funny, you know. <laughs> but, um, he's actually, he's actually laughing, laughing that, at Duncan Fletcher after yeah. he was laughing with him. Well, that was that was just about to mention that because anybody that make, make anybody that makes Duncan Fletcher smile, I tell you what, it's, <laughs> that so mean Pete. You've got to, you've got to be ready for that one. Yeah, sometimes he gets sometimes he gets wind, and then there's sometimes he makes him smile. And I must admit, in eight and a half years, oh, eight years playing cricket. In and around Duncan, I never met him smile. <laughs> I met him frown a few times, but I never, I don't think I ever really met him smile. So. Uh, Army, um, I mean, I have to skip over a bit of your career because we're sort of running out of time a little bit, and also it'd be really good to chat with you again because there's so much to talk about. Mm. Uh, no doubt you'll, you'll cover this kind of stuff on your YouTube channel as well, but I want to pick up, you, we're just talking about, you know, the, the good old days, Pontings, your, your, your mm. Freddie Flintoffs, mm. NASA Hussains and stuff. And some of the guys from that generation have been quite vocal recently about the way guys today, particularly in the England top order, are batting. You know, we're really curious what you think about England's chances heading into Australia. They've got great pace attack, um, but nobody here, or it seems in England, thinks that you blokes can score a run. Um is there a problem with, with their techniques? Do you not wonder whether old blokes just think that their techniques were better? Is the answer somewhere in the middle? Uh, how do England score a run out here? Well, the simple way of answering that, I, I, I've had I, I seen Nasser the other, oh, a few weeks ago when he when he was passionate about going back to basics. And I was talking with, to Mark Butcher with it, and it was like, well, where's your basics? These guys, the guys are standing up tall. No, you know, they're not bent legged, you know, the bats are a million mile in the air. Where is your, where is your cricket in basics? Where, you asked, where does Dom, where's Dom Sibley, where's Rory Burns? as basic technique because there's that many moving parts. There's that many things going out and away and coming back. Bowlers at international cricket, they don't give you many bad balls. I remember a great, a great interview with, with Ricky Ponton talking about Warner McGrath when they were saying, if people wait for the bad ball, of of Glenn or of 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 Shane, it's like the bolt five bad balls in ninety overs between them, mm-hmm. and it's like if you wait for the bad ball, it's not coming. So you have to do something about it, and that just seems that with the England with the England batsmen, you just got to put four or five balls in and around off stump, and they'll nick one of them, 
at this moment in time. And I think when you've got a funny and a weird technique, if it's not all in, in sync and in tune every single second of the, of the, of the game, that you're going to get out. I watched Sibley get out yesterday. It was a good ball yesterday. My young, young Potts from Durham got him out. But it was a ball that an international bowler would bowl. It went into off stump. It swung just away. And his hands were out in front of himself and he nicked it. And if England don't get their top three right, or if the England's top three don't get right, then I don't see them having any chance against India or Australia. Mm. If England get their top three, and the, the, it's not so much the actual runs they score in the top three, it's the balls that face. If they face balls, England have got a good chance of beating India and Australia because the middle order, the powerhouse they've got and the, what they've got going down the line. And I still think they've got a bone attack that can can challenge anywhere in the world. You know, when they come to Australia, you'll have Brodo Anderson with two two guys who bowl, you know, whether Stones fit, Woods fit, Archers fit. You've got two guys that can bowl in excess of 90 mile an hour there, three guys that can that. So two of them plus a broad Anderson, I would imagine will be and Wokes will be I'll play between the five test match. To go with to go with Stokes, then I think you've got a, a, a decent bowling attack. But if England's middle order get exposed, especially against the Kookaburra, which doesn't last for very long anyway, um, then England are in, in, in big, big trouble. But if the bat well at the top, nullify the the, the new the new ball moving or, or bouncing, then I think we've got a series on, both in England against India and in, in and I think England will feel the same about Australia's top order. I think England will feel as though they can get at, potentially get at England's, um, Australia's batting unit. Um, but if you only get 220, 250, mm-hmm. especially, in, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, you're not winning any test matches. You'll end Broad's career, you'll end Anderson's career because they'll be in the field for such a long period of time. Mm. And just last one for me, Harmy. Obviously, um, Jimmy Anderson, 1,000 wick, first class wickets, I think, yesterday he took mm. that. Uh, yesterday, uh, yeah. yeah I mean, where, where does he fit in the pantheon of great fast bowlers? Is he, is he number one? I think he's number one, Matt. I really do. Uh, I'm not just saying that because he's, he's English and I, I played a, a lot of cricket with Jimmy. He's got 51 fifers. 51 five wicket <laughs> holes. That's ridiculous. Um, he's 38 year old and he doesn't seem to geek. I watched the, I watched the, 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 the wickets last night and um, I seen some of the bowling that he bowled yesterday. He bowled a 10 over spell straight through. He was bowling balls. If he had been playing international cricket on that surface, he would have got seven for 19. Mm-hmm. He would have got seven for 19 because there was balls that he didn't get wickets with, which mm-hmm. would have got Virat Kohli out. It would have got <laughs> Jika Rahani out, Pajara out, Shal, all the top Indians out. This guy, he only, only got, he only just got seven wickets because the ones that he, he managed to bowl a little bit straighter that the, the batsman could hit, hit, nicked. And the ones that were in and around that good area of international cricket, around off stump and just outside, where players, players play and, and nick a little bit more, uh, they would have nicked them. The, the only reason he didn't get more wickets is because or he didn't get it for less runs was because the batsmen couldn't, they weren't good enough to hit them. <laughs> he, he had that thing on a bit of string yesterday and he just seems to be getting better and better. Mm. Um, I, think he's, I think he's the best of all time because he doesn't need the conditions to, to move the ball laterally. He got it going. Um, even in the in the southern hemisphere, when not not a great deal, uses the angles, he uses his crease well, great wrist position. I think he is the best. I really do. You know the likes of you know, Big Glenn and Walsh and Ambrose. You know I can go. You can go through the whole list. Um, I just think I just think Jimmy Jimmy goes past them because of the age and longevity and everything that he's gone with it. Yeah. Some will argue that he, he had the conditions. More in his favour for for a uh, for half the year as opposed to the likes of McGrath having to bowl um, or Wakar or, or Wazim having to bowl in the Southern Hemisphere. But I, 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 I still I still think Jimmy's the the all time greatest. Mm. Steve Harmison, thanks so much for joining us, mate. We can catch more of your uh, analysis and views of all types. You know, what David Byrne was like in the showers and is Jimmy Anderson number one <laughs> on your on your YouTube channel, um, Harmy. And, and to those out there, uh, we won't be posting subtitles, I think, between a Geordie and a couple of Aussies. It's going to be tough <laughs> for a few people. But, um, mate, really appreciate your time. It's very early in the morning in the UK. So hopefully we can catch you again, mate, because I really enjoyed it and there's much more to cover. Not a problem. Thanks for having me anytime.